we're starting a series today called Identity Crisis. Identity Crisis. And uh, identity is something that's talked about so often. You've probably heard the term identity crisis before. And uh, I was actually fascinated to discover that a German-American psychologist named Eric Erickson is the one who coined the term identity crisis. And he talks about this idea that, it, that it's not just where you're in a period of life where you maybe feel confused or, or you don't know what to do, but you actually feel like you don't know if life even matters. You don't know what's important. You don't know what is significant, what is even worth getting out of bed for in the morning, where it's this period of just tremendous disorientation, where everything you thought you believed is in upheaval, and, and what you thought was valuable is shaken up. And uh, what we're doing in this series is we're going to be comparing and contrasting, building an identity through secular pursuits, like career, like finances, like experiences or romance, and, and, and trying to build an identity through those pursuits. And, and, and there's so many different ones. I mean, here in Portland, you could, you could build your identity on being the motorized unicycle gang, you know, which I, I've seen hundreds of them going past my apartment. You know, and, and that could be your chosen identity. Uh, uh, there's, there's so many things that you could build your identity upon. I mean, people are building their identities online about you know, being the guy who can flip a water bottle upside down and do the trick shots like better than anybody else and, and, and nail it every single time. And that's what you're known for, and that's what your identity is but what we're, what we're comparing it to is, is we're saying you can build your identity, you can build your system of value, your system of meaning upon things like experiences or career or romance or, you know, your online presence and your online persona. And we're comparing and contrasting that with an identity that's received through God's generous love in Christ. So we're comparing an identity of faith versus an identity basically through secular achievements. And what I want to propose to you through this series is that if you build your identity on anything other than God, that if you believe what is most valuable, what is most significant, what's most important, what's worth living for, that if you build that on anything other than God, you are on a collision course with a crisis. You are on a collision course with pain. And so what we're going to talk about this week is the idea that uh, building your identity on any of those secular pursuits, although those pursuits are not bad, by the way, and we're going to get into that more, those pursuits are not bad in and of themselves. None of them are. But if you make them ultimate, if you make them the ultimate thing about you, the most important thing about you, you're going to find that a secular identity is unattainable. But that an identity of grace, an identity based on the love of God in Christ, it is available. So this week we're contrasting unattainable versus available. But to build your identity, to build your sense of worth, your sense of purpose, your sense of meaning on anything other than God is like driving the wrong way down a one-way street. You know, the one-ways in, in downtown Portland kind of drive you nuts sometimes. <laughs> like, there's, there's so many one-ways, and I live downtown, and uh, it's, it's funny, you know, how you'll sometimes see people going the wrong direction on a one-way, but if you go the wrong direction on a one-way for long enough, you are headed for a head-on collision, and, and what the Bible's claim is, is that if you build your, your life on anything other than Christ, you are headed for a head-on collision with reality. So would you look with me? We're going to look in uh, the book of Isaiah. If you are new to church, I just want you to know I'm so stoked you're here. We started this church not for people who've like been in Sunday school forever. And if you, if you have, that's fine too. But, but if you're new to church, I just want you to know we're glad you're here. Book of Isaiah, it's a book actually, you know, 2,700 years old. It's written to ancient Israel, ancient Judah, Isaiah was this prophet. He was this spokesperson for God. It's a long book, obviously. We've got, we're in fifth, chapter 57. But, uh, but we're going to look at verse 10. You wearied yourself by such going about, but you would not say it's hopeless. You found renewal for your strength, and so you did not faint. 
Whom have you so dreaded and feared that you've not been true to me? And you've neither remembered me or taken it to heart. Is it not because I've long been silent that you don't fear me? I will expose your righteousness and your works, and they will not benefit you. This verse I really want you to zero in on. When you cry out for your help, let your collection of idols save you. The wind will carry them all off. A mere breath will blow them away. But whoever takes refuge in me will inherit the land and possess my holy mountain. And it will be said, build up, build up, prepare the road, remove the obstacles out of the way of my people. For this is what the high and exalted one says. He who lives forever, whose name is holy. I live in a high and holy place, but also with one who is contrite and lowly in spirit. To revive the spirit of the lowly. To revive the heart of the contrite. I will not accuse them forever, nor will I always be angry, for then they would faint because, away because of me. The very people I've created. I was enraged because of their sinful greed, or some translations put covetousness. I punished them. I hid my face in anger. Yet they kept on in their willful ways. And I've seen their ways, but I will heal them. I will guide them and restore and com provide comfort to Israel's mourners creating peace, praise on the lips. Peace, peace to those who are far and near, says the Lord, and I will heal them. But the wicked are like the tossing sea, which cannot rest, whose waves cast up mire and mud. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. Father, I pray that you'd speak right now. Lord, I believe that your word is powerful and I believe that you know us deeply, Lord. You know the struggles, the doubts, the frustrations, the objections, the pain that we, some of us, carry. But you love us, Lord. And I believe that you call us to repentance. You call us to change for refreshing so that we could be revived, so that we could be comforted, so that we could have rest, so that we could find peace. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the first thought that I want to bring to you this morning is this. It's the work that's never done. The work that's never done. I don't know if you noticed in verse 10, but he says, you wearied yourself in these pursuits. You, you were so exhausted, but then you still wouldn't quit. You, you found renewal for your strength, and you kept chasing after them. And what Isaiah is talking about is he's talking about both the leaders of Israel, the leaders of Judah, and also just the people as a whole, and they're looking to two things. They're looking to idols. Those are, those are pagan gods, other gods, right? And they're looking to political alliances. But what are they looking to them for? They're looking to them for the same things that we look to things for. They're looking for security. They're looking for prosperity. I mean, they had idols, and their idols, you know, they had different names. Their names were Baal. Their names were Asherah. Their names were Molech. But what did they represent? Power, sex, and money. They weren't any different than us. They were identical to us. And they were looking for security, partly in these political alliances. You know, uh, one of the verses there, uh, just before this one, it talks about how they were running out to the king. They were looking for these political alliances with Assyria and Egypt. But they were looking for security. They were looking to their idols, ultimately, to give them a sense of identity. And they were frantic. They were feverish. If you read the preceding verses in the chapter. I mean, they, they, were, they were just going after everything relentlessly. They were going after anything and everything except for the one true God. Now, I think ultimately what they were doing is they were looking to their idols for their sense of identity. Now, identity, they wouldn't call it that because the idea of us talking about our identity so much is kind of a new concept. I don't know if you ever get on Google and look at like the etymology of a word. You can look at its, its range, how much is being used. But it's really fascinating. Because now everybody talks about who you are. Be true to yourself. Be your authentic self. Speak your truth. You know, don't, don't be like anybody else. Be who you are, right? We hear that 24 hours a day. We hear it everywhere. I mean, we hear it from the time we're in kindergarten. But that wasn't always the case. Look at the way this... This chart just, just explodes in the 1950s and then even more in the 1980s. And, and it's just this, this constant use of be you, be true to yourself, find yourself, be authentic. And the idea is that each of us are unique 
you know, and, and there were philosophers that recognized that. But then later on into the 20th century, particularly you see in the 1950s, it begins to take on like this moral tone. Like the purpose of life is to be true to yourself. And if you are imitating anyone else, you're almost like wasting your life. You're, you're almost like, like, like someone to be looked down upon. If, if, you're, if you're not being true to yourself, if you're not looking within and, and, and following your heart. Now, how did this happen? How did this happen? Well, this morning, I will say, blame it on the French. <laughs> like this morning, we're going we're gonna to go to the French. Obviously, culture is complex. Ideas are complex. But really, a lot of this does come in the 1950s from the French existentialists. Like, like this is where it comes, okay? Now, existentialism is a buzzword right now. Like, I actually know teenage girls who have existential dread, like, in their Instagram bios. <laughs> like, like it's, a, it's a buzzword. I mean, you see the Barbie movie? She's not dead. She's just having an existential crisis. <laughs> Uh, like, uh, people talk about it constantly. It, it's, it's a buzzword, but a lot of people don't really know the origin of existentialism. Before you can understand existentialism, which apparently, you know, Margot Robbie and everybody is, is selling us, it's just everywhere these days, you have to understand something called essentialism, okay? Before you can understand existentialism, you've got to understand essentialism. Now, essentialism comes from Aristotle, and Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, said that everything has an essence. Everything has an essential quality, an essential quality in essence, like the essence of a knife is cutting, and the essence of a bike is riding, and the essence of a car is polluting. No. <laughs> no. And the essence of a donut is being delicious. Like, everything has an essence. And Aristotle saw it, and, and so many thinkers from then on, thought, we need to discover what man's essence is. What is humanity's essence? What's, what's the essence of men and women? And a lot of cultures, traditional cultures throughout time, said the essence of a person was virtue. It was to be a virtuous person, to discover those moral truths that the universe is governed by and align yourself to them, be a virtuous person. Or other traditional cultures would say it's to bring honor to your family. And that the purpose of life, that, that, that humanity's essence is honor. Or, you know, as, as Christians, we would say our essence is the glory of God. It, it's the way Westminster Shorter Catechism says. It says to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That that's the essence of man. But then you get uh, some French thinkers who come along. You know, first there's Nietzsche and, and Kierkegaard, who actually was a Christian. He, he plays into this a little bit. But really, really where it really takes off in the 50s is with Jean-Paul Sartre. Okay, Jean-Paul Sartre, he's a French philosopher, he's living after World War II, sitting at cafes, smoking his cigarettes, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and, and he's there thinking, you know, living after World War II, and he's the one who says, existence precedes essence. In other words, there is no essence. There is no purpose. There is no God. There is no meaning to life, so man has no essence. We simply exist. We're, we're simply tossed into the universe. And, and because there is no essential purpose to existence, we all have to create our own existence. We all have to create our own essence. So Jean-Paul Sartre says this, life has no meaning. It is up to you to give it a meaning, and value is nothing but the meaning that you choose. And Jean-Paul Sartre says that to live by simply the identity that the government or your family or the church prescribes for you is inauthentic. To, to live just, just this package deal that, that you know, people who just lived before you thought of, they constructed to just go, you know what, I'm just going to live and do what the state tells me. Or I'm just going to be a good soldier or, or to, to live what your parents tell you or to live what the church tells you. That's inauthentic. So we need to be authentic. And, you know, once you see this stuff, once you learn a little bit of this, because the way it goes is, is philosophy gets into the arts, and then arts gets into the populace, and then that gets into the laws. And it just goes, that, that's, that's the way it happens. But once you see this, you can't unsee this, okay? Because, like, once you peek behind the curtain and you, and you see all this stuff, you see that it's just everywhere. It's the air we breathe. It is the storyline of every Disney movie. How does every Disney movie go? Well... You've got 
a little island girl staring at the waters. You know, you've got a little ice princess letting it go. You've got a little mermaid. <laughs> and, and what happens? They're there with their families in this prescribed role. There's this set role that they have to live out. I've been staring at the edge of the water. Right? <laughs> like, like, like they're there. And, and, and to be the perfect girl, like that's how I always felt. No, but like, 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 like it, but then what do they do? They, they break free. They let it go. No right, no wrong for me. Let it go. And they break free and they find their authentic true self. And then once, and, and, and their family's mad at them and, and, and brutal, but then eventually once they discover who they truly are, they come back and save the day and everybody recognizes and validates their new chosen identity. It's the story of every single Disney movie. Thank you, Jean-Paul Sartre, for creating Disney. But, but, uh, but then you get to another French thinker, okay? French thinker today, and this guy is, is popular in Portland. And I want to say this. A lot of these guys have valid insights. I am not up here saying that we need to all embrace the chosen or the traditional identities that our parents forced upon us. Actually, the Bible has a lot to say critiquing the idea of building a name and building a dynasty and building a family clan. Actually, huge sections of the Bible are dismantling the fact that a family can become an idol. So I'm not here pushing traditional values on you. I just am simply uh, exegeting the culture, just explaining the culture that we live in. Okay, so um, then you get to another French thinker who was kind of a contemporary of Sartre, and that's Michel Foucault, all right? Michel Foucault. And uh, he's a big deal because here in Portland, we actually have a bookstore honoring him. It is called Mother Foucault's Bookstore. <laughs> brilliantly titled, brilliantly titled, isn't it? You see what they did there? <laughs> Mother Foucault's Bookstore. And uh, Foucault, get this, he is the most cited academic scholar of the 20th century. He's cited more than anybody else. People quote this guy constantly. But actually, in an interview commenting on Sartre's work, Foucault said this. We'll put it on the screen for you. To a large degree, he agrees with Sartre, but he has you know, various points of, di of divergence, difference. But he says this. From the idea that the self is not given to us, I think there is only one practical consequence. We have to create ourselves as a work of art. Couldn't everyone's life become a work of art? So the idea, there is no meaning to existence. The universe is pointless. And that sounds terrifying, but that means I get to decide the point. I get to invent myself. And, and this, is, this is the world that we live in. This is the reality we live in. And I want to just say for a second, my mom is an artist. All right, I was raised by a free-spirited artist. I actually am an artist myself. I would never, like say that I'm really that great or anything, I always try to find better artists than me and like collab with them or let them do it. But I'm a graphic designer. I studied graphic design in school and, and video editing and, and those kinds of things. But there's a part of this that just sounds amazing, doesn't it? Like it sounds like super liberating. Like yeah, like break out of the shackles, break free. And, and Foucault has some tremendous insights. Like he's a diehard atheist and, and I obviously disagree with him in plenty of areas. But I want to say he has valid insights. He has, there are perceptive things that these gentlemen that I'm talking about have pointed out. But there are some dilemmas. There are some weaknesses. There are some flaws to this worldview. And I actually think Isaiah 57 points out one of them. Look at verse 11. Whom have you so dreaded and feared that you've not been true to me and have never, neither remembered me nor taken this to heart? So he's saying, who have you feared? Who have you been so focused on? Whose opinion matters to you so much that you've not remembered me? See, if you choose not to fear God, you will inevitably fear someone or something else. You're going to fear something. You're going to worship something. Uh, sometimes the word fear had a negative connotation. I think the best way you can translate the word fear in the Bible is to take seriously to take seriously, take God seriously. If you don't take God seriously, you will inevitably take somebody else's opinion seriously. And that is the real flaw, I think, in what Foucault points out. Now, we're just keeping it with the, we're kicking it with the French today. I'm not French. 
I don't know why. These guys just made a big impact. But we're going now with a French-Canadian. Oh, yes, we're changing it up a little bit. So we're going to Charles Taylor. Charles Taylor, he lives, he's at McGill University. I actually lived in Montreal um, for about six weeks when I was a, a, a senior, senior in high school. I lived in Montreal for a while. But Charles Taylor is an eminent, well-respected, just like titan of a philosopher, but he also is a believer in God, and he critiques Foucault and Sartre's worldview, kind of observing this. He says, the modern period, which eventually produces the ethic of authenticity, my difference from you has to be worked out. That's why the word identity becomes so important, as it articulates a sense of what's really important in my life, a standard which I'm trying to live up to, which is why there's such a tremendous emphasis, pay attention to this, on recognition. Having that sense of self recognized. Because we never work these things out by ourselves. Non-recognition can even be seen as a way of blocking my self-development. That is, my difference is not being recognized. Mark those words, identity and recognition. Okay, mark those in your mind. Identity and recognition. You see, what Foucault does is he may render us all our own self-invented works of art, but what we end up becoming is slaves to the audience and the art critic. In seeking to liberate us, he doesn't actually succeed at liberating us. We all find ourselves starved for attention, starved for validation, for recognition. Now, I got two kids here. They're beautiful, wonderful kids. And uh, how often will I come home and, you know, maybe if I'm really, like, being a bad dad and messing up, I'm on my phone or whatever, but they run up to me when I come home. They run up to me when I'm, you know, distracted on my phone. And they, what, what do they say? They say, look what I made, Dad. Look what I made. And they show me, like, some crazy, sometimes it's disturbing. It's like a crazy scorpion, you know, turning into a transformer, murdering the city or something. I'm like, that's great, son. That's wonderful. But like, you know, my daughter will run up to me and it's like a, you know, a, a, a hippopotamus having tea with a giraffe that she drew. And it's kind of like, you know, impressionist or so. I don't know what's going on. But, uh, but, but what do they come? They say, look what I made, daddy. Look what I made, daddy. Because there's something deep inside of us that does that, right? That we want that recognition. We want that validation. It's not enough just to create art, that art, we need someone to call that art beautiful. And sure, Sartre and Foucault, they may render us like Kevin McAllister, living alone, home alone in the universe, eating rubbish and, and junk food, you know, better, you better come out and stop me. Like, like they, they may set us free to be liberated, saying, you know, we can do whatever we want. But they also leave us cosmic orphans, running around vying for attention, vying for validation. So, so uh, I'll give you an example of this. A perfect example of this is this quote by Madonna. Most of you probably have heard of Madonna, I would imagine. But she says this. She said in an interview with Vanity Fair, all my will has always been to conquer some horrible feeling of inadequacy. I'm always struggling with that fear. Even though I've become somebody, I still feel I must prove that I am somebody. My struggle has never ended. I guess it never will. And Madonna was the Marilyn Monroe of her era, okay? Like, she was just astronomical. I mean, in the 80s, in the 90s, even in the 2000s. I mean, she was just the biggest and the best and the brightest that there was, We'll leave that quote on the screen for a second, and I just want to say this, and I don't want to say this with compassion for her. I'm not trying to knock her. I'm just pointing out the world that we live in and the system of value that we live in. How much more painful must this quote be now that many in Gen Z would yawn to hear her name? How much more brutal must this quote be that, that they're busy with K-pop stars and 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 Billie Eilish and, and whatever else, and they could care less about her. But here's what I want you to know. Taylor Swift may, de, may be the Madonna of today, but she'll join her in irrelevance 
tomorrow. And, and you know, we can create ourselves and, and create our own identity and, and be these own works of art, but like Charles Taylor says, we're starved for recognition. We're desperate for validation. And it's exhausting. It's unattainable. Building an identity on anything other than Jesus, it will leave you exhausted like Madonna, constantly trying to prove yourself. Even, even with the greatest achievement, the Grammy Awards, the, the, the VH1 Awards, the MTV Music Awards, you know, the list can go on and on and on. You can have a million followers. You can, you can be at the very top, but you're going to find yourself going, I'm trying to prove that I am somebody. I want to prove that I'm not a nobody, but my struggle, it just never ends. I guess it never will. And most of us will never achieve her level of success, but we can find ourselves on the exact same treadmill. Look at verse 12. I will expose your righteousness and your works, and they will not benefit you. Righteousness is simply that what you believe makes you acceptable. It's the thing that makes you worth accepting. That's what righteousness is. It's, it's acceptability. It's, it's being uh, validated. He says, you know, the things that you're looking to for your righteousness, they're not going to work for you. They're not going to benefit you. They're not going to give you the validation and acceptance that you want. So the work that's never done. The next thought is this, the soul that never rests. The soul that never rests. I was enraged by their covetousness, or some translations say sinful greed. I punished them and I hid my face in anger. Yet they kept on in their willful ways. Now it's kind of fascinating. I, I, I can be a skeptical person. I can be inclined to go, I don't worship idols. I don't like pound jungle drums and bow down in front of a statue. Like I don't throw virgins in a volcano. <laughs> like I'm not an idol worshiper. But check out Colossians chapter 3. This one just pinned me to the wall. Put off covetousness, which is idolatry. Covetousness is just the desire for more. You want more. You want more recognition, more money, more wealth, more experience. It's just, I need more, I need more, I need more, I need more. Paul says in both Ephesians and Colossians, that's idolatry. That that's the essence of idolatry. It's you think you need more of this thing to give you worth. You need more sex. You need more money. You need more prestige because that will finally make you feel satisfied. It will make you feel valuable and it make you feel enough and paul says that's the same thing that's exactly what they were doing when they were bowing down to their idols uh timothy keller uh, who recently passed away he's a hero of mine he put it this way we prime we don't primarily sin because we want bad things we sin because we want good things too badly you know i mean the bible starts and god says it's good it's good it's good the, the sea the land the sky it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. And then you get to Exodus 20, and it's like, but don't make an idol out of anything in the sky. And don't make an idol out of anything in the land. And don't make an idol out of anything in the sea. They're good things. But when you take a good thing, and you make it an ultimate thing, it becomes a bad thing. And, and, and that's the essence of idolatry. It could be your job, money, a romantic partner. It could be your children. But if you make your children an idol, if you make your romantic partner an idol, you will crush them under the weight of your expectations. And you will also either be filled with drivenness or a nagging anxiety or both. And you will constantly live with that. Now look at verse 13. When you cry out for help, let the collection of your idols save you. The wind will carry them off. A mere breath can blow them over. But whoever takes refuge in me will inherit the land and possess my holy mountain. The things that we're looking to, and we're going to talk about this more next week. So this week, the message is titled, Available versus Unattainable. Next week, it's going to be Durable versus Fragile. And what he's getting at here is this, is that that mansion that I'm trying to build, it's a sandcastle. It's vapor. It's just one economic downturn, one, one breakup, one divorce, one injury, and that thing that I'm looking for for my identity, it's gone. It's gone in an instant. A mere, a mere breath can blow them away. I, I, I think what uh, really gets to the heart of this so much is, is just a, a very modern example. 
I read in the, the Daily Mail UK that 75% of kids and teenagers say that when they want to grow up, they're not looking to be a doctor or an actor or even you know, a rock star or a lawyer or certainly not like an accountant. <laughs> I don't know if any five-year-olds ever wanted to be accountants. Maybe they did. I don't know. But, <laughs> but what does 75% of kids want to be today? YouTube or TikTok influencers. 75% of kids... When asked what they want to be when they grow up, they want to be influencers. Well, what's sad is you can read article after article in the New York Times and Vox.com and, and Washington Post, articles titled things like this, the influencers are not all right. I read this article, I mean, that one blew me away. Another one that blew me away is one from Vox about influencer burnout. And this TikTok influencer who has millions of views says this, the scary thing is you never know how long it's going to last. I think that's what eats us up. I think that is what eats us up a lot at night. It's like, what's next? How long can I entertain everyone for? How long before no one cares? How long before my life is worth nothing? A, a mere breath will blow them over. The wind will carry them away. Put this next quote on the screen. It's by two different journalists. Uh, Rebecca Jennings was actually quoting Barrett Swanson in the Vox article. But it says this, I'm sitting here amid this sea of beautiful young people, all of them desperate for recognition. Their whole lives ahead of them, empty at the absolute center. TikTok is a sign of the future, which already feels like a thing of the past. It is the clock counting down on our 15 seconds of fame. The sound the world makes as time is running out. And then, Swanson, and then uh, Jennings says, the influencer industry is simply the logical endpoint of American individualism, which leaves us all jostling for identity and attention, but never getting enough. Now, what's interesting is Swanson and Jennings didn't read Taylor, but they said exactly what Taylor said. Just desperate for attention, recognition, desperate for identity. Gallup reports that in 2022, American mental health was the lowest it was in all of human history. Mental health said it's lowest. It's not just the influencers who aren't all right. Those of us who are being influenced are not all right either. <laughs> now, verse uh, 20. But the wicked are like the tossing sea, which cannot rest, whose waves cast up mire and mud. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. Now, I was hanging out with a friend a while ago, and he works at Nike. And, uh, and I love Nike. I mean, I'm wearing Nikes right now. You know, so nothing, nothing against Nike per se. But just an observation is he, said he worked in Nike sportswear, NSW. And, you know, he was confiding in me about how exhausted he was, how burned out he was. But he said, you know, there's a saying at Nike sportswear, NSW, never stop working. Never stop working. And this text says that, that the wicked cannot rest. The sea never stops, right? The waves are always just lapping against, lapping against the beach constantly, constantly tossing up the muck in the mire. And, and what this text is saying is saying, if we build our value on anything other than God, we're going to be like that tossing sea. It's unattainable. You will never stop working. You will be the soul that never rests. But I don't want to talk rail against the world's wickedness. What do I want to talk to you about? I want to talk to you about my wickedness. Okay, let me tell you about my wickedness. I shared a little bit of this with you last week. And that's that, you know, for a lot of my ministry, I believed in Jesus, I believed grace, but there was levels of it that hadn't reached my heart, that hadn't hit my heart. And I wanted to achieve, and I wanted to build an identity for myself. And, and to some extent, I was successful. You know, I raised hundreds of thousands of dollars. We had something going on in the Pearl District, which was pretty cool. Uh, I was getting invited to speak around the United States. I got invited to speak internationally in Portugal on an all-expense-paid trip. 
You know, it's, in so many ways, I was attaining that dream, but on the inside, I had no rest. There, there, there was not peace, you know, and, and, and there were other factors, and I want to I say that I'm a huge fan of therapy. I'm a huge fan of medication. If you come to counterculture long enough, I'm sure we'll eventually talk about how we believe in the idea of the image of God and common grace, but so I'm, so I'm a big fan of medication, big fan of therapy, but there was something else going on too, and that's this. Now, I found that I was anxious because I was ambitious, and that there was a connection between my anxiety and my idolatry, and, and I so badly wanted success, and that ambition, it made me anxious because I said, what if I don't get it? What if I don't succeed? What if I fail? What if this, you know, what if the, the turnout of church isn't big enough? What if don't, enough people don't come? And eventually, it all came crashing down. And I shared with you last week that I had a mental health crisis and, and, and a diagnosis. But in losing it all, my idols were exposed. And, and as I went through this 10-month, 12-month, brutal depression of almost not wanting to live, by God's grace, it became apparent to me, you know what, I need to really believe what I'm saying, that, that my greatest value, that my identity would match up with God's greatest priority, His system of value. And that's what um, losing a lot of it taught me. So I don't want to just talk about other people's wickedness. I want to talk about my own. But I want you to know this. You will be like the tossing sea. If you throw yourself after those pursuits, you will be like that soul that cannot rest. And we'll close out here, and we're almost done here. The last thought is this, the God who's with the lowly. The God who's with the lowly. For this is what the high and exalted one says, he who lives forever, whose name is holy. I live in the high and holy place with those who are contrite and lowly in spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly, to revive the heart of the contrite, I will heal them. This is down in verse 18. I will guide them and restore them. I will create praise on the lips. Peace, peace to those who are far and to those who are near. What I'm telling you is this. An, an identity based on success or money or fame or influence or romance or experience, it's unattainable. It's not available to everyone. You know, there's people who are prettier. There's people who get more swipes on Tinder than the other person, right? <laughs> like, but, but an identity based on grace, it's available to all. It's available to everyone. But we don't always want that, do we? We want something that's unique. We want something that's special. We want something that distinguish us, distinguishes us from everyone else. We want to be like Winnie the Pooh's hyperactive best friend. They're bouncy, trouncy, flouncy, pouncy, fun, 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 fun. But the most wonderful thing about Tiggers is he's the only one. <laughs> Guy's a narcissist. <laughs> <laughs> like, he wants to be special. He wants to be better than everyone else. But what does this passage say? It says that God dwells with the lowly. He dwells with the lowly, with the contrite. God isn't there for you just when you're getting the accolades and, and the retweets and, and you're blowing up. God's there for you at your lowest, at your weakest, when you've got nothing left to give. And that means that grace is available to all. If, if we were saved by our achievements or if our value came from, comes from our achievements, then that's only available to the talented. That's only available to the superlative. That's only available to the exceptional. But if your value comes from the love of God, which is a generous gift, just poured out to the world, poured out to everyone, like we sang, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, if it's available to everyone, then that means that, it, that, it, that it's there for the broken. It's there for the people living in the tents under the freeways who've got no followers. You know, it's, it's, it's available to the black. It's available to the white. It's available to the rich. It's, it's there for the poor. It's there for the weak. It's there for the strong. It's there for the educated and the uneducated. If we are saved by grace, then we can have a system of value, identity, significance, worth that cannot be taken away and that comes freely as a gift to anyone who needs it. That is what's unique about grace. And he says, peace, peace to those who are far and to those who are near. Now, I like Foucault's idea of being a work of art. 
My mom's an artist. We put on a huge art showcase this summer. We hope to put on more art showcases. We love the arts. We, we started this church for artists. But I got a little bit of a suggestion for Foucault, and that comes from uh, the Apostle Paul. Look at Ephesians 2, 9, 9 to 10. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done, so that no one can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece that he created anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things that he planned long ago. You're God's masterpiece. And you don't have to boast and prove that you're better than anyone and, and, and you know, get the spotlight and achieve something. No, you're accepted by grace. And all you have to do is you have to just throw yourself into the flow of God's creative process that he has good things for you to do, that he has people for you to love. Now, what does this all mean? How, how do we live this out? Well, I want to close the sermon and, and, and not go on for too long. But I'll just say, how do we live this out? I would say that for me, a huge shift after my brutal breakdown and depression was choosing to spend my time loving people who couldn't make me more famous. To, cho to choose to love people who couldn't get me more money or couldn't do more for me, but to say, you know what? I'm going to love the lowly. Jesus is with the lowly. I want to be with the lowly too. There's not time for it today, but Isaiah 58 is all about how that if we go and serve the oppressed, we serve the broken, we strive, we pour ourselves out for the hungry, that we'll, we'll become like the noonday. We'll become a new creation. We'll live on the holy mountain, which is the new Eden, that, that, we'll, that, that, that we'll be what God intended us to be. And, 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 and I think that's why it was so beautiful having every child here today is, is this. If you compare yourself with those who have more, you'll always feel poor. But if you share with those who have less, your soul will always be rich. <laughs> And here's the kicker is this, is that Jesus became poor for us. Jesus wasn't born at the top of the Ritz-Carlton in a penthouse. Jesus was born in the equivalent of the Skidmore Fountain Max Station. Jesus died to pay for our sins, yes, but he also died in solidarity with the oppressed. He died amongst the poor, naked, stripped of everything he owned, and his blood was poured out for us. And as we, as counterculture, seek to love those in need and see the image of God and the beauty in their faces, and, and, and as we seek to love those in need, we're going to become people of deep peace.